All right, uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, if you could turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. Uh, next week, we fit, next Sunday, we finish off our study of Colossians, and then we're going to go into a 10-week study on what Christian fellowship is, with, which will actually tie in with what we're teaching in 1 John, which is about fellowship. And then uh, after that, in September, we'll start a new book in the Old Testament. We're going to do a, a book that's only one chapter long. It'll take us, I think, a little over a month to do. It's only one chapter long. It's called Obadiah, so... We'll be doing that in uh, September. And uh, so I think uh, what I want to do is make uh, next several announcements for those people who are unfamiliar with our ministry. I have had um, some people who uh, hit our website, and then they hit, uh, we're on YouTube, we're on Facebook or Google Plus, people see our stuff. So our class schedule for those people who are unfamiliar with our ministry is Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evenings from 7 to 8 p.m., and then Sunday morning, of course, from 9 to about 10, 15, we have the Lord's Supper the first Sunday of each month, which we usually end around 10, 30 when we have that. And then we have a corporate prayer meeting. We have a corporate prayer meeting on Sunday after, after our brunch. And then we have a corporate prayer meeting for our internet people. You can join us on, with it, the, through the internet on Thursday evenings after class as well. We have a Sunday morning offering. Every, uh, every Sunday we have a, an offering. And uh, we're a, um, we don't... Uh, we don't sell our materials or anything. Everything is, uh, it's a grace ministry, but that doesn't mean it's for free. So it, as it says in Galat uh, Galatians 6, 6, those who are taught the word of God are to share all good things with those who teach them. And those who proclaim the gospel must get their living from the gospel. So uh, we take our Sunday morning offering every Sunday right after class. Hey, Nathan, how you doing? Say Bill. Say Bill. You make me so happy if you say Bill. You want to touch the guitar? Touch the guitar, yeah. I don't care. I'll still end talk. Yeah, good, touch the guitar. You break it, you're all done. Nathan's playing my guitar. He, I think every kid, my, including my, uh, my nieces and nephews, they all love to play my guitar. You like that, huh? Don't knock it out of tune or you're going to send you back to your mother. <laughs> Hi, buddy. So anyways, Nathan the prophet, there he is. Hi. Hi, that's Jody, yeah. So if you're in town, for those who are uh, hitting our website, um, uh, we, if you notice, we don't have an address for, our we, uh, for where we, we teach and meet, and the reason why that is we meet in a home, and uh, that shouldn't be unusual because the early church met in homes as we've been studying in Colossians, we've studied in Romans, and, uh, but um, we're just a little uh, house church out here in, uh, in Marion, Iowa, and if you want to come and visit us or take part in the services, you're more than welcome. Uh, just call the phone number that's on the website. That's my personal phone number. And then I'll give you the street address where Titus and Jody Thompson live here in Marion so that you can come and join in our services. So uh, that's our class schedule, and that's uh, just about all the announcements I have. And let's take a moment of silent prayer, as is our custom. We do this to examine ourselves to see if we need to uh, confess any sins to the Father. If, we're, uh, if we have unconfessed sin, we can't have fellowship with God. God is holy. And so he is not tolerate, uh, he will not have, uh, he does not tolerate sin and sinners unless there's a way that can be made, uh, and that's through Jesus Christ. Now, we're in God's family through faith in Jesus Christ, but God's still holy, that doesn't change. So when we sin, and we have unconfessed sin in our hearts, uh, then he requires that we confess it so that he can have, so you and I can have uh, fellowship with him. So confession of sin restores us to fellowship with God, and then we have to we maintain that fellowship by obeying what the Holy Spirit says to us through the Scriptures. And that's when we're obeying the command of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit, and Colossians 3.16 to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. So if there's anything disturbing or distracting uh, to any of you, uh, do what 1 Peter 5.7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. And uh, also, uh, I like to use uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. It says, don't be, Paul says, don't be anxious about anything, but pray and give, uh, offer thanksgiving to God. And so this is a very important time because we, we want to, if we're going to worship Jesus Christ, this is why we're here, to worship the Father and the Son and the power of the Spirit. And uh, so we want to ensure the fact that our worship of Him and His Son would be acceptable, and He'll accept it if it's done in the power of the Spirit. So... With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray.
Father, we thank you for another day, that you, beautiful day that you've given to us. We thank you for creation. We thank you for giving us the senses and the body and the, and, the, and the souls that we have so we can enjoy it and also to enjoy fellowship with you and your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you so much, Father, for making us children to, of, you, of yours through faith in your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for loving us while we yet, we were yet your enemies, sending your son to the cross to die on the cross for us when we were your enemies and antagonistic to you and opposed to you. And we just thank you, Father, for this great sacrifice and the sacrifice of your son. We also thank you for raising us up and seating us with your son, Jesus Christ, through the baptism of the Spirit, when we were dead in our sins and transgressions. We thank you for this great love, and we pray that we might reflect this love right back to you by loving you with our entire being and strength, and also loving each other in the body of Christ as your son has loved us and uh, treating all men the way we want to be treated. We just thank you, Father, for uh, this ministry that you've given to us here in Marion, Iowa. We thank you, Father, for everyone here this morning. And we just thank you for Titus and Jody Thompson opening up their home to us, their hospitality. And we just thank you for Titus's work with the sound and the recordings, the video, the audio, the technology. And we pray that you give him wisdom in that ear this, uh, this morning. We thank you for those who, taking, who are taking advantage of it this morning. Uh, live through the website, or at a later date through the recordings on the website. Father, we, we just thank you for this study in Colossians, and we pray that you would bless us in this study this morning as we study uh, Paul's uh, command to the Colossian Christian community to, see, uh, to tell Archippus to fulfill his ministry. And so we pray that this study would be a blessing to your people and bring glory to you and your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to each person individually and as a corporate unit. Help those in the audience by the power of the Spirit to understand what's being taught, to be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction, to be humble, and carefully consider the passages and principles we'll be noting here this morning. We pray, Father, that you would help me as the communicator to bring forth your full counsel to your people with accuracy and clarity, reverence, respect, and power, so that your people can continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We also pray that in the song service, we just pray, Father, that the songs... The song that we'll sing here this morning will bring glory to you and minister to your people and will be done in the power of the Spirit. And we just thank you for the voices that you've given to us, the instruments that you've given to us so that we could uh, to do this, that we could worship you through music. So, Father, we pray for this service in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, uh, could you turn your songbooks to page 196, You Are My Father, something I wrote as a congregational song. Page 196, You Are My Father. And for those on the internet who never heard this song, it's because I wrote the song. <laughs> it's actually one of the first congregational songs, songs I ever wrote to be a congregational song. So. <laughs> this face is funny. Okay, here we go. You are my father. All of my days I'll be singing your praise because you have redeemed me by giving your son my freedom's been won and you will be loving me. What you do when I am afraid, I know you'll protect me. For the prayer I made, I know you ever. When I am alone, I know you are with me. We'll faithful and true, I rest in your word. Praising your ways because you truly love me When you gave up your son, my work is all done And you will be loving me throughout all eternity And I will be loving you for who you are and what you do When I am afraid, I know you'll protect me 
all the prayer I made I know you ever When I am alone I know you are with me Faithful and true I rest in your word Oh, you are my father All of my days I'll be singing your praise Because you have redeemed me Giving your son my freedom's been won And you will be loving me throughout all eternity And I will be loving you for who you are and what you do Oh, you are my father, oh yes you are You're my father, oh you are You're my father seated. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. Glad you liked the song. <laughs> well, it is, yeah, he loves music. He heard my music in the womb. <laughs> Too funny. Sorry, you just, <laughs> you get a lot going on over there. I know that. All right. You should be at Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. It's your broken leg. Yeah, keep Tyler, uh, Tyler, keep Titus in praise. Got that fractured ankle, so I think he goes to the doctor, not this Monday, but the Monday after, I believe. So keep him in prayer that it's, it's healing up. I think it is. But he is certainly milking it over there. I just know that. I, mean, I just know that. I would be. You kidding me? All right. Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. As I said before, we're approaching uh, the end of the book. Next Sunday is our last class in this uh, particular book. And uh, it's interesting. I was looking at the, the hits on the website for this study. And uh, it, it, a lot of hits. I mean, in the triple digits for every class, pretty much. And, uh, and we're talking like in hundreds and hundreds. So that's this people who... Uh, are, are um, listening to it, watching it, and it's also, we have the, all of our classes, uh, you know, everything that we ever teach here, we also have a written documents and inter in great detail on all of these books that we've done. Colossians, we have the, uh, the, the interpretation, the exposition of, the, uh, of the, every verse in this book, so it'll be, uh, they're all available on the website, so for those who are able to take advantage of that website, take advantage of it, it's, uh, it's there for you. And uh, so we're looking at Colossians 4.17, and we're going to talk about another pastor that Paul talks to, uh, talks about here in, in Colossians. We've seen Tychicus earlier in Colossians. Uh, he was another, one of those pastors, and uh, he was actually had uh, communicated information about the false teachers, the Judaizers, with their protonostic teaching. Uh, he communicated to, to Paul, Tychicus did, he communicated to Paul while he was under house arrest in Rome, and, uh, and uh, waiting his appeal before Caesar. And he was, Tychicus communicated the situation in Colossae and that area in Laodicea. And then we've seen another man, Epaphras. He was another one of those pastors in the Colossian Christian community. And then we see one more, Archippus. And as we'll see here this morning, Paul orders the Colossians to command Archippus to fulfill his ministry as a pastor. So uh, remember the early church, we taught, we taught this in Romans, we taught this in Colossians, we've seen this already in Colossians 4, the early church met in homes. Now that doesn't mean that if you don't meet in a home that you're not really truly a church, that's ridiculous, but the early church did meet in homes and uh, that's where they started and that's where I believe they'll, they'll end up. And we see that uh, the church buildings didn't come about until the third century AD. And so that doesn't mean, again, I must balance that because we're in a house. Somebody will say, well, that's because you're in a house. You don't no, I, there's nothing wrong with having a church building as long as uh, the church building and the finances and all that stuff that goes with, along with a big building or building doesn't get in the way of taking care of God's people. We, the people of God come first. In fact, the people of God are what compose the church, not a building. A building we could meet outside if we wanted to. Jesus taught in open, the open air. Uh, the apostles, uh, they taught by rivers. They taught by everywhere. So I've, I've, myself, I've even taught at a rodeo one time. Believe it or not, I was, I was first came to Iowa, I was in a belt plane. Somebody asked me if I would do, do a little teaching at a rodeo, before a rodeo. I was like, I don't care. 
just don't put me on one of those horses or whatever. That's all I cared about. About bull, whatever they, you know, bull riding. But uh, I never understood that, and I never will. But anyways, Colossians chapter 4, verse 17. We're talking about another pastor in Colossae. So, but it's interesting uh, how when Paul says this, when he, when he, you know, he says to the Colossians to command Archippus to fulfill his ministry, it's kind of interesting how he addresses the Colossians to, to do this. And uh, so that it's going to tell us something about the pastor and the Christian community that he is serving by teaching the Word of God, how they're, inter uh, they're, to inter uh, they're uh, interdependent, as we'll see here this morning. So I have you at, uh, we'll pick it up in context in Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. I'm going to read from the Net Bible, and uh, in verses 10 through the end of the, the book. So it says in Colossians 4, 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you greetings, as does Mark, the son of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. In terms of Jewish converts, these are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they've been a comfort to me. Epaphras, he's another pastor, who is one of you, and a slave of Christ, greets you. He is always struggling in prayer on your behalf, so that you may stand mature and fully, fully assured and all the will of God, we, the, the fact that he says that he's struggling in intercessory prayer for the Colossians, that's one of the responsibilities that a pastor has, as we've studied in the past, we'll see again here this morning. So that's tipping us off that he, Epaphras, is a pastor. And also, when he says uh, he's a slave of Christ Jesus, Paul describes himself in his writings, and Timothy as a slave of Christ Jesus. And so he does Tychicus as well. That's an, uh, usually a... a, 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 a a description for pastors. So then he goes on to say in verse 13, For I can testify that he, Epaphras, has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. That's telling us there also that he was a pastor. He's serving the body of Christ. Verse 14, Our dear friend Luke, the physician, and Demas greet you. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters who are in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church that meets in her house. There's, a, there's a telling us that a church met in homes. A, we don't know how many uh, churches that met in homes in Colossae and Laodicea. Then it says in verse 16, And after you have read this letter, have it read to the church of Laodicea. In turn, read the letter from Laodicea as well. So they're telling, Paul's basically saying, swap letters. After you, uh, it's been read, you made a copy of it, send it on. And then I want the letter to Laodicea, as we pointed out, which was the Ephesian epistle. And uh, I want that, I want you to read that. So there was an exchange of letters. This went on, this was cu customary to do that. Paul mentions the exchange of letters in 1 Thessalonians, as we saw last week. The exchange of letters is uh, something that the church has always done. Of course, all, of a, all these letters have come down to us, and uh, we have uh, our New Testament is composed of these letters, and these letters, because they were circulated, made copies of, circulated throughout the Roman Empire, uh, uh, therefore, uh, uh, the... Uh, Christianity spread very, very quickly. And uh, that's why you see that one of the reasons why the New Testament, more than any other ancient document in history, all, this, all the different secular writers of the ancient world, uh, you know, all the great uh, ones, Herodotus or, uh, you know, uh, uh, Josephus or any of these people or Tac Tacitus, any of these ancient writers, uh, they didn't have the manuscript attestation that the New Testament has. Because the New Testament, when they got out these letters, they made copies of them. These were very, very, uh, d these documents were very, very important that we now have in our New Testament. And that's why the New Testament has greater attestation, manuscript-wise, than any other book of antiquity. And that's a fact. That's not my opinion. That's just count the, all you have to do is count the manuscripts. We have them in the thousands. Of, if you talk about Greek, we got them in Latin copies of the New Testament in Latin. We got them in Coptic, which is ancient, the Egyptians. We have all types of languages. And that it tells you how, that's one of the reasons why Christianity spread. Unlike Islam, they frown upon, this is not just, you can, this is their doctrine. They frown about making copies of the, uh, the Quran. But the New Testament, there was a, 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 it was encouraged to make copies of the New Testament and, and, and pass them along. So then it says in verse 17, and tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting by my own hand. 
Remember my chains, his imprisonment, grace be with you. Now, in the New American Standard, it's uh, Colossians 4.17 is translated this way by them. Say to Archibus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. So this command here is uh, in, in addition to the previous commands we see in verse 16. Now, when he says, say to Archibus, Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. The word say there is the word lego. In the Greek, it means to say, to tell, to communicate. And specifically, it means the command because he's basically saying, uh, pass along this command to Archippus. So you can translate it Archippus. So you could say, command Archippus to do this. Then the second person plural form of this verb is speaking, it means all of you. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's not in the singular, it's plural. He's speaking of all the Colossians, the Christian community in Colossae, as a corporate unit. And it's also used, uh, it's used as a corporate unit, and it's talking us, everybody's supposed to be involved with this command to Archippus. So the Christian community basically is b being asked to uh, encourage this guy to keep going forward in his ministry. Now, it's in the aorist imperative form. It's what we call in Greek grammar for those who are interested, and there's some on our website that uh, are interested. It's a constitutive aorist imperative. What you need to know what that means is this. It's emphasizing the solemn nature of this command, emphasizing the urgency that the Colossians obey this command to communicate this command to Archippus. It's also emphasizing how extremely important it is for the Colossians to pass along Paul's command to Archippus that he take heed of his pastoral ministry in Colossae. So you could translate this phrase instead of say, or as the, the New American Standard has, uh, they say, and tell Archippus, you could say this, and solemnly command Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you received in the Lord. That would be a better translation because it brings out the nuances of the tense and the mood there in the Greek. Archippus, uh, this man has been mentioned before in Scripture. We studied Philemon, that book, in the past in our Sunday classes. If you recall, he was mentioned in Philemon too. This man, Archippus, is the same individual, more than likely, that we see in Philemon 2, because both Philemon and Colossians, as we pointed out, were sent to the same location. And so, how is that? Philemon was from the Colossae. The Colossian epistle was taken by Tychicus, and and in also the Philemon epistle, and brought to Colossae, because Philemon lived there. So this man, that would tell us that Archippus, is, here in Colossians 4.17, is the same Archippus that appears in Philemon 2. In fact, uh, uh, hold your place real quick. Let's take a look at that. Look at Philemon 1. There's only one chapter. Philemon 1. It's right near there, right near Colossians. Philemon 1, from Paul, oh wait, Philemon 1, from Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, oh, oh wait, you got it? Oh, okay. I don't like this Bible. Oh, use the table, ta use the ta use the table of contents, Tell there's a table of contents. Okay, no, I gotta wait for you, what's the, it's not a big deal. Because I, I find, I have, yes, I'm the same way with my Bibles. When I first got this, when I had the Logos program I started doing on the computer, it was really weird. I didn't like it at first because I, you know, I was used to, the, you know, my hands on it and a certain Bible and a certain, where I could find stuff. Yeah, yeah, Titus, he, he's, he's playing video games. He's playing video games on that thing. <laughs> Finally, even one. You got it? Okay. From Paul a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-laborer, to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, and then he says, our fellow soldier. That word fellow soldier is a tipping, off, tipping us off that he's a pastor, because that expression in the Greek um, is, is basically used of Paul and Timothy, all who are pastors. And to the church that meets in your house, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this archippus is the same archippus in Colossians 4.17. How can we get that? Well, because uh, of the description of him and also the fact that Colossi, the Colossian epistle in Philemon went to the same place and was sent to the same place, Colossae. 
And so, because Philemon lived in Colossae. Go back now to Colossians. Chapter 4, verse 17. So, in the New American Standard, it says in Colossians 4.17, Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. So, it says, take heed. Now, in the English, you know, I don't know, let's say the Net Bible, what do they say? They have, see to it that you complete the ministry you received in the Lord. I like that better. Take heed. We don't use the word heed in English anymore. That's why, you know, uh, it's good to have different translations. I think the... Uh, what are they, uh, the, the today's NIV. They say, see to it that you complete the work that you received in the Lord. That's a good translation as well. Uh, the uh, Christian Standard Bible says, pay attention to the ministry you received in the Lord. That's pretty good too. And then it says uh, in the ESV, uh, it says, in the ESV, uh, it says, see to it that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. All of those are very good. They're around, as we'll see in a second. In the New American Standard, take heed is the verb blepo. It means to pay careful attention. That's why the, the Christian Standard Bible uh, uh, translates that way, this word. It means pay, care, pay careful attention to something, indicating that Paul is commanding this man, the Colossian Christian community, to tell this man, command this man, Archippus, this pastor, to continue continue to make it his habit of watching out carefully for his ministry in the sense of being ready in the future to deal or address any dangers or deeds or, or, or needs, excuse me. The implication is that this man Archippus must be prepared to respond appropriately to these dangers to his ministry and needs. Now, what have we been studying in Colossians? Remember in Colossians 2, 8 through the end of the chapter? The Judaizers with their incipient form of Gnosticism who try to put people under the Mosaic Law. The Mosaic Law was g given to the, the, the nation of Israel. That's clear from Romans 9, 1-5. Paul says that. It wasn't given to the church. The church, the reason why, is the nation of Israel, the, the, the law was given to the nation of Israel to govern the social, political, economic, and religious life of the nation of Israel. And the church is composed of two races. That's why in Acts 15... If you recall, when the, uh, there were Gentile believers, P Gentiles being saved and receiving the baptism of the Spirit, some of the Jewish Christians said, they got to be put under the law. they got to be circumcised. And they brought it to the attention of the, the apostles, who were all Jewish, of course, and they said, no. And if they were to be, the Gentile believers were to be put under the Mosaic law, they would have instituted it right there. But they didn't. The gospel governs the life of the church. And as we saw in Colossians chapter 2 and 3, our identification with Christ should do so. We're crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ, and therefore we're to appropriate by faith that position in Christ and consider ourselves dead to the sin nature, Satan's cosmic system, and alive to God. And it's, it's our, the gospel, the good news, is what's to govern the life of the church. And when you think of gospel, I've said this many times, the gospel in the New Testament is not just used of justification, of going to the unbelievers and giving them the good news about Jesus. No, it's the good news is also related to the life of the church. We have good news given to us. We're, we're freed from sin and Satan. We don't have to be in bondage to sin and Satan. We actually are free from it. And we experience that freedom in Christ by appropriating by faith our identification with Christ. So when you come to the temptation of sin or temptation from the devil's world, you say, no, I've died to that, the world. I've died to sin because I've died with Christ and I'm, I'm going to live and in, in, in pleasing to God and that's when you're truly living. That's when you're experiencing eternal life. Christianity as the only alternative lifestyle. We have the Christian way of life, which is supernatural way of life that demands a supernatural means of execution. It's theirs your, to, for you to use at any time and that's why when you're having fellowship, you're living in eternal life as a believer. So, this is very important. In light of the situation in Colossae, and Archippus would have, it was facing this like Tychicus and Epaphras, this, uh, 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 this uh, threat from the Judaizers who were trying to put Christians under the law when the gospel was to govern the life of the church, not the law. And so he goes and he says, he goes right after the situation and said, I want you to be, pay careful attention, Archippus, because these guys are out here. Pay, also, when he says this, he wants this guy, Archippus, like the rest of the Colossians, to take heed as to what Paul says in this Colossian epistle. Because it will help him in dealing with the attacks of the Judaizers. Now you might be saying to yourself, well, we, how is, uh, we don't have any problems with the Judaizers today. Really? I have, we have people right in this area who believe as Gentiles that you've become a Jew. 
Don't tell me it's not around. It's everywhere, especially with the, the internet and the proliferation of false teaching on the internet. There, you are not under the law as a Christian, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. You're under the gospel. Your life is governed by the gospel, not by the Mosaic law. Paul says again, it was given to the Jews. And you're not a Jew. If you become a believer in Jesus Christ and you're a Gentile, you still stay a Gentile. Paul calls them Gentiles, the believers. In Ephesians 2, he calls them Gentiles. He doesn't call them Jews. But there are people in this area who are Judaizing people. And I'm against that. I'm opposed to that. And I think these people know that I am. They know the words out about me about that. They probably listen. And I'll tell you right now, if you, if you run into these people, I want you to be prepared because you've been taught and you've been prepared for the people like this. You are not under law. You should know the chapter and verse where you can go to to show them that they're in the wrong. And if you don't know that, just ask me. I'm here at 24-7. Just try not to call me at 2 o'clock in the morning. Anyways, the present imperative form of this verb I don't want Malik calling me at 12, or Cheyenne calling me at 12 or 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm sleeping. The present imperative of the verb blepo is a customary present imperative. The force is for Archippus simply to continue to make it his habit of paying careful attention to his ministry. The word for ministry is the word diakonia, for those who are interested. It pertains to a positional role of service. Here it's used in relation, of course, to Archippus. And, it, and his particular function in the body of Christ, and specifically, it refers to his service as a pastor. So when he says it's correctly translated ministry, sometimes you could translate it service, something like that. Ministry is good as well, because it's giving you the idea. See, the translators here, the New American Standard, they believe that this guy is a pastor as well. Uh, ministry, ESV translates it ministry, and same thing with the Net Bible, uh, the Christian Standard Bible, ministry. And the reason why they're all looking at this guy as as being a pastor as well. That's why they use the word ministry there. Now, uh, we see it says your, uh, his ministry in the Lord. Look at the uh, New American Standard. It says, take heed to the ministry which you have received, Archippus, in the Lord. And the, the Net Bible says, in the Lord as well. What's this phrase, in the Lord? Well, in the Lord's actually saying, in a, in, it means in agreement with the will of the Lord. Meaning, you receive this ar ministry, Archippus, in agreement with the will of the Lord. The word for Lord there is kudios in the Greek. It refers, of course, to Jesus Christ. And notice that Paul doesn't say Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus or Lord Jesus Christ. He just uses Lord here because he's trying to emphasize that Jesus Christ is the ruler over the church. And therefore, he is the boss, the ruler of Archippus. And in other words, Archippus is serving, like I am, the Lord Jesus Christ and all pastors. So it's emphasizing his rulership over the church. We saw in Colossians 1, 15 through 20, that Jesus Christ is not only the creator, but he's the ruler of the church. He's not only the ruler of creation, but he's the ruler over the church. Now this word, kudios, is the object of the preposition and which is translated in your Bibles with the word I -N -N. And it's functioning as a marker of a particular standard or rule specifying, specifying the rule or code of conduct a person follows or the standard of conduct to which he or she conform, conforms. Now here, this word Lord contains the figure of metonymy, metonymy, meaning that the person of the Lord is put for his will. This happens in English. It happens in all languages. Now, this would all indicate that Archippus received this pastoral ministry and he received it in conformity with or consistent with, or we could actually say in agreement with the will of the Lord. And it's interesting, this word, this prepositional phrase in the Lord, it's actually used in Colossians 3.18 and Colossians 3.20 where you can translate it in agreement with the will of the Lord. It's used in relation to women, Christian wives, obeying their husbands as un in the Lord. That means in agreement with the will of the Lord. It's the will of the Lord that you obey your husbands in all things as unto the Lord. And it's also used the children in Colossians 3.20, where the children in the Christian homes are to obey their parents in all things as in agreement with the will of the Lord. It's the, father's, it's the father and the son's will that you children in the Christian homes obey your parents in all things. That's how it's used. And uh, in Colossians 3, 18 and 20. So uh, actually, hold your place and look at my translation of Colossians 3, please. Quickly. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. Colossians 
Colossians 3.18. I'll show you this prepositional phrase that's found with relation to archippus. Now we'll see it in relation to Christian wives and Christian children. Colossians 3.18 in my translation. Wives, each of you must continue to make it your habit of voluntarily submitting yourselves to your husbands because it has always been an appropriate obligation in agreement with the will of the Lord. Your Bibles would say, in the Lord. Then husbands, it says, each of you continue to make it your habit of divinely loving your wives. Correspondingly, each of you continue to make it your habit of not being embittered against your wives. Verse 20, children, each of you continue making it your habit of obeying your parents, submitting in every circumstance, because this is well-pleasing in the Lord, in agreement with the will of the Lord. So see, it's used of Archippus in Colossians 4.17, this phrase, in the Lord, and also use of wives in relation to their husbands and children in relation to their parents. Go back now to Colossians 4.17. So basically, Paul's saying, Archippus, uh, the Lord gave you this ministry. It's an agreement with his will. And that means, what does that mean? It's tied to his spiritual gift. At the moment of your justification as a Christian, each one of us got a spiritual gift. Spiritual gifts of assignments, of position in the body of Christ. Everyone gets one gift. It's not plural. Peter makes that clear in 1 Peter 4.10. As you received a gift. He doesn't say plural gifts. See, because some Christians think that they, they confuse their spiritual gift with certain talents that they have. So let, well, in other words, you could be this. You could, have the, you could have a spiritual gift like the gift of helps, which is extremely important in the body of Christ, like all of them are. And th this particular gift can manifest itself and cooking, and being in carpentry, plumbing. What, it, could, it could be a whole host of things. It's very broad category, and a lot of your talents could be found in these. You know, so uh, we, there's, everybody has a gift. Assignments of position in the body of Christ. Just like a football team has different positions, not everybody's the quarterback, and not everybody's the coach. All right? So if everybody thought they were the quarterback, and the left tackle, who's 450 pounds, thinks he's going to play quarterback, he's not going to cut it, all right? And he needs to be at left tackle, protecting the quarterback's blind side. So we have assignments and position in the body of Christ. Everybody's gift's important, and they're very important because the eye, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, I cannot say to the, uh, the hand, I have no need of you. Same in the body of Christ. We can't, say, we can't say we don't need each other. We do need each other. I need you. And this is what Paul's saying to Archippus, the, the, and to the Colossian Christian community to tell them to pass along this command to Archippus to fulfill his ministry because Archippus needs the Colossians. Every pastor, if he doesn't have anybody to teach, he can't exercise his gift. So he needs you and you need him because as we've seen in the past in Ephesians 4, the uh, 11 through 16, the communication gifts, the function of the communication gifts, uh, apostles, prophets, pastor, teachers, they uh, all these gifts are designed to build up and edify the body of Christ. And what do they do? These gifts they communicate. They use to communicate the word of God to the Christian community. So you need me, and I need you. Fulfilling, you know, fulfilling what Paul said in First Corinthians twelve that we need each other. Nobody's independent of anybody. So he's basically saying, Archippus, you received this a gift at the moment of your justification, just like all Christians received a gift. And your gift is teaching, you're the pastor, and you need to fulfill it. Your gift was given to you and in agreement with the will of the Lord. And every one of your gifts, whatever they are, you have received that in a will, in the, from the will of God. God, Jesus Christ, sovereignly determined that you'd get that gift, and he authorized the Holy Spirit to give you that gift at the moment of your justification. So all of you are talented, all of you are gifted, and you're all, those gifts are designed to serve. My gift is designed to serve you. There's a gift of evangelism, which is designed to serve the body of uh, the, uh, the unbelievers. That gift brings in people and adds numerically to the body of Christ. Whereas the gift of pastor, teacher, his gift, the function of his gift, it builds up spiritually through the communication of the word of God, the body of Christ. So the, the evangelist, his gift is directed at the unbeliever, Everybody else's gift is directed toward the believer, your fellow believer. That's why you have to meet with each other. We're commanded to meet with each other. If you don't meet with other Christians, 
then you're not going to be able to use your gift. And listen to me, I must qualify that. Just because your, your spiritual gift can function outside the four walls of the, the home or the church or the building that you're in. If you're serving another Christian with your gift, it doesn't mean it could be anywhere you're serving the body of Christ. It doesn't have to be within the four walls. So serving is what we're here to do. We're to follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Archippus, he's called a servant, and, he, and that's what a pastor is. And this is another thing. Pastors are not, you don't, you're not to uh, put, make pastors to be celebrities. That doesn't mean you don't honor and respect them. You're supposed to because of their position of authority. But you're never to make them out to be celebrities. We're not to lift pastors up above Jesus Christ. He's the top celebrity in the church. Nobody else. I'm to The function of my gift is to facilitate you worshiping Jesus Christ, not you worshiping me. Because some pastors don't get that. They're into the celebrity thing, and churches choo people choose pastors because of uh, they, they're uh, entertained by the guy, or the guy's got great charisma. Charisma is nothing to do with it. Faithfulness, content of their character is what you, how you should choose a pastor. Is he teaching you the word of God? Are you getting fed? If he's not, he's probably not your pastor. Or if he is your pastor, he's in apostasy then. Because... You need to choose a church and a pastor based upon the content of the man's character and the content of his teaching. And the early church had met every day to teach. Read Acts 2, 42 through 47. Jesus taught every day in the temple. Jesus, uh, Paul taught in the school of Tyrannus every day. We're to teach as much as we can. And if, if man does not, Jesus said, man does not live on bread alone, but from every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And you eat everyday food in the natural realm, how much more should you eat your spiritual food, the word of God? So Christians getting a fed once a month and, or on a Sunday for 20 minutes doesn't cut it. It doesn't cut it. It doesn't cut it. You need to be fed. That's why when you come here on a Sunday, I'm giving you the full hour. I go over sometimes hour and 15 minutes because you need it. And if you can't be here, hit that website. Take some time and listen to the, the teaching on the website. We record it and take advantage of it. When I'm teaching, there's no, you just listen to what it has to say. It's to your benefit. It's going to help your marriage. It's going to help your, your relationship. It's going to help you with your kids. It's going to help you with your fellow Christians. It's going to help you with your walk with God. And that's what we're here for, to serve God. So look at Colossians 4.17. Colossians 4.17. In the New American Standard, it says, Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, or as we saw, in, agree excuse me, in agreement with the will of the Lord. Then we have the purpose for this, that you may fulfill it. That expresses the purpose for which the Lord gave Archippus his pastoral ministry. You may fulfill. It's the word plero. It's the same word that is used in Ephesians 5.18 by Paul, to be filled with the Spirit. The word filled there means is the word plero, but it doesn't, it has different meanings depending on the context in which it's found. It has a wide semantic range. Here, in our context, it means to fulfill one's duty to something. It means to fulfill the task of performing a particular activity, to complete the task of performing a particular activity. So therefore, this verb speaks of Archippus fulfilling the task or completing the task of his pastoral ministry. So, uh, Paul uses it this way of his own ministry in Colossians 1.25 and Romans 15.19. Look at Romans 15.19, uh, chapter 15. We'll pick it up. I'll tell you where we're going to pick it up. But go to Romans 15, please. Look at Romans 15.14. Romans 15, 14. But I myself am fully convinced about you, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct 
one another. But I have written more boldly to you on some points so as to remind you because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. He's talking about himself. I serve the gospel of God like a priest so that the Gentiles may become an acceptable offering sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So I boast in Christ Jesus about the things that pertain to God for I will not dare to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in order to bring about the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed. Notice that Paul's not boasting of himself. If I've done anything, he's saying, <coughs> it's because of God working through me. And this should be a way in the past. This should, every pastor should be thinking like. Shouldn't be thinking, oh, I'm so wonderful because I'm so smart. I'm smarter than everybody else. Or, I'm so eloquent. I'm so talented. No, you can't do anything without Christ. And if anything that you've done is acceptable to God, it's because Christ worked through you. It's true of all of us. Now he says in verse 19, and the power of signs and wonders and the power of the Spirit, so far from, so from Jerusalem, even as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And, and in this way, I desire to preach where Christ has not been named, so as not to build on another person's foundation. But as, that, but as it is written, those who are not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. Now when he says in verse 19, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ, uh, basically the, the idea of Plerello is found there, as well. They actually kind of uh, give you the sense the New American Standard, uh, the Net Bible, not the literal uh, translation of the verse. I believe the, uh, let me give the, the ESV. Uh, yeah, the ESV says, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. That's how they translate it. By the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. I have fulfilled it's used the same way of Archippus in Colossians 4.17. The Net Bible just it does a little bit more of a dynamic equivalence there. Go back, go to now to Colossians chapter 1. Look at verse 24. Colossians 1.24, Paul uses this word, plero, in a sense to fulfilling his ministry, like he does, uses it of an archipus, and how he uses it of himself in Romans 15.19, he uses it this way in Colossians 1.24, now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I fill up in my physical body for the sake of his body, the church, what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. As we saw, nothing. He, what he means there is, because I'm a part of the body of Christ, any undeserved suffering is Christ is suffering because he's the head. So when I suffer undeservedly as a member of his body, Christ is suffering. That's the idea. And that's true of all of us. If we're suffering undeservedly, it becomes the sufferings of Christ because he's the head and we're the body. Verse 25, I became a servant of the church according to the stewardship from God given to me. And then he says, in order to complete the word of God, that is, the mystery that has been kept hidden from ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. Complete there in order to complete, play So basically, uh, you can go back to Colossians 4.17. So basically, he's saying Archippus, when he uses this word in Colossians 4.17, he's saying Archippus. He says, you're still alive, you're still on this earth, and you need to fulfill your ministry. Keep going, keep plugging away. He's not implying that the guy hadn't been doing this. He's trying to encourage the guy. Why? Because Paul is in prison. That could be discouraging. Also, there's a threat from these false teachers, the Judaizers. So there's a lot of pressure on him to protect his flo the flock of God. And also, he might be discouraged because ministry can be discouraging. It can be discouraging. And that's the and so he this guy might need might need encouragement in all these areas because of all these these three things. Now, if you could look at Colossians four seventeen in my translation. And for those on the internet, do I have Colossians four on the website? I think I think I think we might already. I'm not sure, but it's all right. You don't have to look at it. I'm just trying to. I could figure it out myself. Because I want to tell the people on the internet, they want to they want to look at that translation of my translation of Colossians. They can they can uh, go to our website. And uh, yeah, uh, you might, yeah, you have the the translation of the whole epistles on there, so you can download the translation of the epistle of 
to the Colossians, my translation, go into our written library and then look under Colossians. So, Cool. Thank you for doing that, Titus. Look at Colossians 4.17. <laughs> my translation. I you gave a funny look to your, your daughter there. I solemnly charge all of you to command Archippus. Continue to make it your habit of paying careful attention to your ministry, which you received in agreement with the will of the Lord, in order that you would fulfill it. So Paul, as we can see, is issuing the Colossian Christian community another solemn command, which is in addition to the two he issued them in Colossians 4.16. Here in verse 17, he orders the Colossians to pass along a command to Archippus, which required that he continue to make it his habit of paying careful attention to his ministry. And the reason why Paul orders the Colossians to pass along this command to Archippus is that he knew, Paul knew, that pastoral ministry, the ministry of a pastor, is not merely an individual activity on the part of the pastor. Rather, it's an activity carried out with the support and encouragement of the Christian community because all believers are members of a single family, the royal family of God, the body of Christ. You're all members of the body of Christ. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Colossians 1. We're all, as everyone in the Christian community who's trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior is a member of the body of Christ and Christ is the head. So therefore, if that's the case, pastor like Archippus and all pastors, they're dependent upon the body of Christ. Because the function of their gift, it can only function their gift, the gift of pastor, teacher, can only function if there's the body of Christ is present. If there's no body of Christ for, to, to listen, he can't function in his gift. So therefore, and you can't grow to maturity unless you have the gift of pastor, teacher. People who think that they can go without a pastor are deceived. You're allotted to the charge Every Christian's allotted the charge of a pastor, and it's up to you. And God makes it clear who your pastor should be. Oh, don't tell me. I've heard enough stories to, uh, to write, uh, crack me up some of this, self, uh, this stuff. You, uh, God makes clear who your pastor is. There's no, God's not a God of confusion. He, he, knows, he says you need a pastor. He's told you who the pastor is. And some people have walked away from their pastors, and they're under discipline for that. And so you know who he is, and you know that. God's made it clear to you, and therefore go to him. And, to, and, and you are, he's there to help you grow to maturity. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Let me show you this. A passage we've seen quite a bit in the past. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. We'll pick it up there. Ephesians 4.1, I therefore the prisoner for the Lord urge you to live worthily of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, the church, the body of Christ, one spirit, just as you two were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But, to each one of us, grace. No, it's in the, no, it's in the singular. That's your spiritual gift. Kare what's the word in the... Uh, in the uh, uh, do, 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 do. It's the same word that use, they use for spiritual gifts, I think, or it's related to it. But it doesn't matter. I don't know why that's not coming along with this. All right, so it says, but to each one of us, grace, that's the spiritual gift, was given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Therefore, he's talking about spiritual gifts. Therefore, it says, when he, Jesus, ascended on high, he captured captives, he gave gifts to men. Spiritual gifts to us. Now, what is the meaning of he ascended except that he also descended to the lower regions, regions, namely the earth. He, the very one who descended, is also the one who has ascended above all the heavens in order to fill all things. It was he, Jesus, who gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. Now, pastors and teachers is one office, one gift. Because, as I said before in the past, there's an article in the Greek before prophets, before evangelists, before pastors, but not before teachers. So if there, if there was five different gifts being mentioned there, there would be an article before teachers. There's not. That's because Paul wants you to know that pastors and teachers go together. Pastors hyphen teachers. Or you can go teaching pastors. What it means is pastor speaks of his authority. Teaching speaks of his function. 
And what were, the, what were the purpose of all these gifts, these communication gifts? To equip the saints, you, the church, for the work of ministry. We're all in full-time Christian ministry there. There it is. And I'm to give you the word of God so that you can function in ministry. That is to build up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Unity is based upon obeying the teaching of the word of God as communicated by the pastor. And to the knowledge of the Son of God. A mature person, there it is. You need the function of the spiritual gift to pass the teacher to grow to maturity. Attaining to the measure of Christ's full stature, so we're no longer to be children tossed back and forth by waves and carried about by every wind of teaching, by the trickery of men, of people who craftily carry out their deceitful schemes. I protect you from false doctrine. There's a movie out there called The Shack. Stupid book, stupid book. The guy didn't stick to the scripture. And you might say, oh, I want to see that movie. Don't go see the movie. Or you're going to see the movie. It's false doctrine. You know, the nail prints in the father's hands. And, you know, and the, and the feminism about the, with the, the father. It's all baloney. It's not scripture. Jesus is the only member of the Trinity who has nail prints. Not the father or the spirit. That book is not even, even close to scripture. Throw it. Why would you want to watch false doctrine on the big screen? Why would you waste your money on that stuff? Or buy the book. I would buy the book only just to see what, what they're saying so that I can, ref, you know, so I can s understand what these people are saying so I can refute it or see if it determine if it's wrong according to scripture or it isn't. But false doctrine is everywhere. The teaching then, yeah, as a Gentile, a Christian, you believe in Jesus and you're a Gentile. Now you become a Jew. Now you wear a yarmulke and you read your Old Testament in the Hebrew and all that stuff. People are doing that in that area. False doctrine. You could lose your salvation by committing a sin, certain sins, false doctrine. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you receive the forgiveness of your sins, past, present, and future. There's no sin that you could commit after you're saved, including murder, as witnessed by King David. He was a believer and committed murder. He conspired to kill Uriah the Hittite, who he had an adulterous affair with his wife, and to cover it up, he had him killed on the battlefield, cover up the fact that he got her pregnant. And he's in heaven. Peter denied the Lord three times that he ever knew him as a believer. Is he in heaven today? Yes. False doctrine is everywhere, people. And your pastor is here to protect you. or He should be doing that. Verse 15. But practicing the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into Christ, who is the head, from whom the whole body grows, fitted and held together through every supporting ligament, as each one does its part, the body grows in love. Uh, look at, uh, quickly, look at First Peter. This is for the people who don't think they have a pastor. They're everywhere. First Peter chapter 5, verse 1. So here's God, he, Jesus Christ, God. He gives the church, the men with the gift of pastor teacher, to teach the word of God to the body of Christ. And you get Christians saying, well, I don't have a pastor. Basically, you're rejecting Jesus' authority. Because he says you need a pastor. You know, I find, I, I hate to say it, but you know who I, what gender does this more than anybody I've seen over the years? Men. Men. Be careful. It, pride comes before a fall. Men have a hard time to submitting to other men. And the men who do are humble. And, in fact, a pastor does, shouldn't even be given a ministry until he's shown that he could submit to another man's ministry. He can't, he does, he's not, if he can't respect the authority of his pastor, why would God want to give him a ministry where he's asking people to respect his authority and submit to his authority? He's not ready to be a pastor if he can't submit to his own pastor's authority. 1 Peter 5, verse 1, look what it says. So as your fellow elder, fellow pastor, and witness of Christ's sufferings, and as one who shares in the glory that will be revealed, I urge the elders among you, the pastors, give a shepherd's care to God's flock among you. Basically, fulfill your, your, your job as a pastor. Set an example for them. Model the word of God for them. Feed them the word of God. Study the word of God because you can't teach what you don't know. And pray for them. That's a, a shepherd's care for his flock. Exercising oversight, not merely as a duty, but willingly under God's direction. And not for shameful profit. But eagerly, that's why I do not charge for my books. I could go... 
I could go to a pat, I could go to a publishing place, get my book sold, and I could do a lot of different things. But I don't. The Bible says not that it says Jesus and the apostles never charged for their teaching. The prophets of Israel never charged for their teaching. It says you have a right to earn your living from the gospel, but it doesn't say to put a price on anything. Please, and you get people ever since the, the, the establishment of publishing houses, people in the church selling their books. Whereas prior to the publishing houses, prior to the printing press, did Jesus and the apostles and the early church fathers and up, did they charge for their books? And yet you got people out there who are, act, or, or, are highly respected, I respect, and they're making a killing out of their books. I can't afford some of their books. And yet, and, and I can't afford, and I, that's why I don't even put a, a, chi, a price on my thing, because somebody who's in, who can't afford it, and you know, it may be in poor Africa or Pakistan, I'm not going to let put 9.95 or 20 bucks on my books, so it's a hindrance to hindrance to the people who are poor to buy this material. Why would I do that? I'm hindering the communication of the gospel. So we're pa he's saying, pastors, you don't do it for the money, and you know your pastor's not doing it for the money. Find out what his salary is and what else he could be, he could, what he could be make, what he could be making, and he, what he's making, and he's still doing it. And if you think he has a low salary and he's still doing it, he, that tells you that he's doing it for the right reasons. He's not doing it for money. Look at verse 3. And do, look, very important. And do not lord it over, talking to the pastors, over those entrusted to you. These people are tr entrusted to these guys. The ESV. They translate this. They said, not... Uh, not domineering over those in your charge. Not domineering over those in your charge. Uh, the Today's NIV. Uh, they say, um, not lording it over those entrusted to you. So the, he's basically saying the, Christ, the, the flock of God, the Christians in the church, are entrusted to the authority, the care of these pastors. Go back to Colossians 4.17. So here we see Paul, without this, he, what he's basically saying here is that the reason why Paul orders the Colossians to pass along this command to Archippus is that he knew that pastoral, pa, Paul knew that pastoral ministry is not merely an individual activity on the part of the pastor. Rather, it's an activity that's carried out with the support or should be carried out with the support and encouragement of the Christian community, because believers are members of a single family, the royal family of God, the body of Christ. Without the support and encouragement of the Christian community, the man with the spiritual gift to pass the teacher can never fulfill the purpose of his gift, since his gift is designed, as we pointed out, to function in the presence of the Christian community. That's another reason why Paul says in Colossians or Hebrews 10, you're not to forsake the assembling of yourselves as the habit of some. Of some. The gift of teaching can only manifest itself in the presence of the Christian community, and the function of this gift is communicating the word of God to the Christian community. Now, this man, Archippus, as we pointed out, same guy we, as we saw in Philemon 2. If this is the case, then he appears to be the pastor who taught in the home of Philemon, as indicated by the command here in Colossians 4.17. Paul's description of Archippus as a fellow soldier is further indication that Archippus was a pastor since the only other time that he uses this expression, fellow soldier, it appears in the New Testament, it's used to describe a pastor. The word occur occurs in Philippians 2.25 to describe Epaphroditus, who was one of the pastors in Philippi. Lastly, the language Paul uses to exhort Archippus in Colossians 4.17 is reminiscent of the language he uses with Timothy to exhort him, Timothy, to continue to remain faithful to his ministry and First and Second Timothy, and especially First Timothy 4.16. Hold your place. Look at First Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse 11. So it's interesting. If you look at 1st and 2nd Timothy, and you look at uh, Colossians, with, uh, what he's saying at Archippus, what he says in Titus, 1st and 2nd Timothy to Timothy, all those books we've studied in detail, 
Paul was giving encouragement to these guys. Pastors need encouragement too. It's a tough job, guys. You're going to bullseye on your back. The pastors, the Satan, you think Satan, who do you think Satan wants to do? Stop the communication of the word of God. And who's got the gift to do that? The pastor. So your pastor is under much more pressure than anybody else. Much is riding on, riding on him. He's got a responsibility to not only study and teach and pray for you, and, but also set an example. And so he faces temptations that you don't see. And pressures you don't see because of his position. Not because he's better as a human being than you or is more value to him to God than you. No, it's his position. So it's a tough job and it's very discouraging. And we're in the days of apostasy in America where the church in America, it doesn't want to listen to sound doctrine. They want to go to the Joel Olstein ministries where he's packing out auditoriums of 18 to 20,000 people and some baseball stadiums like Dodger Stadium with 60,000 people. But a guy who's teaching the word of God, chapter by uh, expository teaching, chap, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, he's lucky if he can get 50 people in his place. That's the, that's the sign of the times. Now look at what Paul says to Timothy. They were living in days of apostasy. Look at first, uh, uh, first was it? Uh, I said first Timothy, right? Yeah, first Timothy chapter four. Verse 11, command and teach these things, Paul says to Timothy, the, the things in the first 10 verses of chapter 4. Let no one look down on you because you were young, but set an example for the believers. See, set an example in your speech, conduct, love, faithfulness, and purity. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture. We saw this last week. To ex exhortation, to teaching. And where's counseling? Where's counseling? That doesn't mean I don't, a pastor doesn't counsel. I'm talking about the professional counseling thing that's going on in the church. Well, you don't see the apostles telling the Timothy and Titus to do this. Like the, you know, when you get, the, 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 all these guys do is have somebody come into your office. You're like a psychiatrist. Psychologist, am I right? Psychologist. And you, you, know, you come into the office. It's a professional thing. The church never knew anything about this. For, 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 20, for, tw for 2,000 years, you get to the last 60 years in the Christian community, and the Christian community and pastors are starting to look like the world. I counsel people all the time in my church. They want to, I say, well, you know, I'll talk to Tyler, I'll talk to Titus or Jody, Cheyenne, whoever it is, and I'll, uh, uh, Bill or Crystal, from time to time, I'll, I'll counsel them on certain things. Just as a godly advice to somebody, if they're asking for it, or even if they're not asking for it, I see something, a problem going on. But, that's, but I'm not doing this professional counseling where you come into my office and some pastors even charge a fee. Oh my gosh. Where's that in my Bible? It's not anywhere. It says, the teach, he says. Do not neglect the spiritual gift you have given to you. Basically, that's what Paul's saying to Archippus in Colossians 4.17. And confirmed by prophetic words, this gift was, which the elders laid hands on you. When the elders laid hands on you. Then he says in verse 15, take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that everyone will see your progress. Be conscientious. I love that. About how you live and what you teach. See what I said before? You measure a ministry not by how many people are coming to the building or how great the music ministry is or if they have docking stations for your laptop in the church or they have uh, the great production and they you like the, and you the pastor is charismatic oh he's so cute and his wife who's an, a co-pastor and pff, that's another part, sign of apostasy women are not to be pastors in the church and oh we love her oh he's, she's great and we choose a ministry on that Meanwhile, the content of the message, he's only teaching for 20 minutes, and if he's teaching, he's talking about nothing about the Bible, telling stories or talking about some social or political cause, nothing about the gospel. And his character, what kind of, is he a muddy, is he all about money, or is he immoral himself? What kind of life is the pastor living? You should be wondering, what kind of life is Pastor Bill living? It's all in, see, you know where I am, I got a boring, most boring is life in America. Content of their character and their teaching. How you live and what you teach. Persevere, he says in this, because by doing so, you will save both yourself and those who listen to you. So, again, we see there that Paul is exhorting Timothy to continue to remain faithful in his ministry. 
And as, as we say in 1 Timothy 4.16, now go back to Colossians 4.17 and we'll close. So Paul wanted Archippus to pay careful attention to his pastoral ministry in the sense that he wanted this man to be ready in the future to deal with or address any dangers or needs. The implication is that of Archippus being prepared to respond appropriately to these dangers to his ministry and needs. It appears Archippus was already doing this, and this command is merely an encouragement and preventative maintenance on the part of Paul. How do we know that? Colossians 1, 3-5, Colossians 2-5, in those verses, Paul affirmed that the Colossians were faithful to the gospel, which would indicate Archippus was faithful because he was a part of the Colossian Christian community. Also, we see that Paul in Philemon 2, which is written at the same time as Colossians, Paul describes Archippus as a fellow soldier. If he was in apostasy or not doing his job or failing or falling away, Paul wouldn't have described him as this. Remember, Colossians and Philemon were both delivered to Colossae at the same time and by the same people, namely Tychicus and Philemon's runaway slave, Onesimus. Now, Paul felt the need to issue this command to Archippus because he needed encouragement, because Paul was incarcerated in Rome, and because of the threat from the Judaizers I mentioned earlier, and their false teaching, which Paul addressed in Colossians 2, 8-23. In fact, this command in Colossians 4, 17 uh, corresponds to the commands Paul issued both Timothy and Titus. His letters to Timothy and Titus, which we studied in detail, were all designed to encourage these men in fulfilling their pastoral ministries in the face of difficult circumstances and opposition from false teachers. And may I interject this? If you're, not, if you're a pastor listening to my voice and you're not getting encouragement from your congregation, you can always get it from the scriptures. <laughs> In fact, you should be getting primary your encouragement from the scriptures. Because most Christians, most people in your ministry will not encourage you. It'll be a certain few, it seems like. But you can always count on God to give you encouragement. I'll never forget the day when the church split was happening in Norway back in 2010. And I was leaving on the process of the final days were coming. We're in, we're in the final days. And I was, I remember, you know, geez, you know, is this it? Am I going to be able to teach anymore? You want me to, you, you want me to get out of the, the teaching of the word of God? And I was serious. Like, I'm going to go back to Massachusetts. Then what am I going to do? And I just picked up first Timothy and Paul said, God called him, considered him faithful to call him into service. And that encouraged me because it's just, I don't know how to expire it. The Holy Spirit said, no, you're faithful, Bill. You're going to keep teaching. I don't, I, you're going to go through moments like that. I don't know. It just spoke, it just spoke to me. I knew it. And that's, it's, it, I kept, here I am in Marion against all odds, all odds. We're in this, still in this area, still teaching. We're still all around the world. Thanks to the efforts of Titus and you who are supporting this ministry, this tiny little ministry. And we're reaching throughout the world. We got people from Alabama come up and visit us. And he, we're just, this, God doesn't need an army. He doesn't need an army. He can use a small group of people. He took 12 apostles and turned the world upside down. You think he needs an army? No. Paul asserts that Archippus received this pastoral ministry, as we saw, in agreement with the will of the Lord. He's speaking of Archippus being a faithful steward with the spiritual gift that the Lord gave him at the moment of his justification. Paul states that the purpose of the Lord giving Archippus his pastoral ministry is that he would fulfill it. This is the same language, as I pointed out to you, that uh, he uses in Colossians 1.25 and Romans 15.19, when speaking of his own ministry. When Paul speaks of Archippus, fulfilling his ministry, which he received in agreement with the will of the Lord, he's speaking of this man being a faithful steward with a spiritual gift that the Lord had given him. He will give an account, like all of us will, to the Lord Jesus Christ at the Bama seat in order to determine if he merits a reward or not for being faithful to this task of communicating the gospel to the church. We study this in, a, in between books on Sundays. The Bama Seed Evaluations on our website. It's on YouTube. It's everywhere. Go back. The little article of the Bama Seed's up there. It happens immediately after the resurrection and the rapture of the church, which is imminent. And then each one of us will give an account to the Lord to see if we were good stewards with the time, talent, and treasure and truth that God gave us. Your sins are not the issue. Your salvation is not going to be the issue. That was determined at the moment of your justification when you first trusted in Jesus. No. Were we good ser servants? Were we faithful or unfaithful? That's what's going to be determined. If we're faithful, 
then we'll get a reward. If not, we won't get a reward. Still saved is yet through fire, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. So as we close, when Paul speaks of Archippus, fulfilling his pastoral ministry, he's referring to this man being faithful and fulfilling his fourfold responsibility as a pastor. What are that? What is that? Study, teach, pray, exemplify godliness. Study, 2 Timothy 2.15. You can't teach what you don't know. You can't teach what you don't know. These lessons that I have have been prepared three months in advance. And the, week, the last, three, last three weeks leading up to teaching this, I go over them. I look over them. I know the passage inside out. I, went, I find tooth combed every, every word and clause in the Greek text. You can count on it. It's happened. And you can see what I've done through the written documents of this verse and all the verses in Colossians and everything I've done. It's all there. My work is all for those to see. It's totally, what's the word? Um, but you know, well, you could, uh, you, like we were talking about, the president always talks about being, Obama, President Obama used to say, uh, being, uh, you, uh, what do they call it, transparent. It's all transparent. You can see it all there. You can see what I'm doing with my time. I ain't playing golf. I play once a week, maybe. I'm not a scratch golfer, but if I could play every day, I would be a scratch golfer. I'll take anybody on that, except for Titus. The scriptures teach that the pastor is the overseer, as the overseer has four responsibilities, and they are the means by which he tends and shepherds the flock of God. Study, teach, 1 Timothy 4.13, pray, Acts 6, 1 through 4, exemplify the Christian way of life, 1 Timothy 4.12, 2 Timothy 3.10, Hebrews 13.7, to name a few. Uh, verses. All right, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that this lesson would be a blessing to your people and bring glory to you and your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for everyone here this morning. We pray that each person will be spoken to, guide them in the application of these things that they have learned. We pray that as they apply these things, that uh, they would bring glory to you and continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it is in his name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to take up our Sunday morning offering. Remember, it says in Galatians 6, 6, that those who are taught the word of God are to share all good things with those who teach them. And while that, song, uh, that offering's taking place, I'm going to sing us a song. And the song I want to sing is The Bama Seat. Cheyenne will tell us the, the, the page number in our song books. The Bama Seat. One fifty four, the girl says, the woman says. And if you are on the internet, you can go, uh, uh, our P.O. box is on the website there if you want to send us something. And uh, or if, you've been, if you've been received anything here th today, or you can go, uh, pay, we have PayPal, and uh, wherever how you'd like to do it, if you, feel like you, if you feel led by the Spirit to do so. Let's pray for the offering. Father, we pray that this offering would be given by the power of the Spirit in obedience to Galatians 6, 6 and other passages and that it would be a blessing to them because your son taught it's more blessed to get than to receive. We also pray that as a result that this would produce many thanksgiving to you uh, from the recipient. We thank you for all those who are part of this ministry that you've raised up that are good, are good stewards with the finances that you've given to them. So Father, we pray for this offering in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Soon we all must stand before the Lord, oh yeah Whose word is pure and so much sharper than a sword, oh yeah As I live, says the Lord, every tongue shall give their praise to me And everyone shall bow, each and every single knee
seat Oh yeah, all right mm. Build up on the rock in everything you do Oh yeah, serve him out of love and in the spirit too Oh yeah, the quality of your work he's gonna test with that Yeah. 